Okay, good afternoon. We'd like to start. At last year's FMM conference, Karl Christian von Weizsäcker announced in a meeting to mark the 50th anniversary of the so-called Cambridge Capital Controversy that he would return in 2019 with a book on saving and investing written jointly with me. This book, he said then, would present a radical new approach on the macroeconomics uh, of savings and investment based on capital theory. Our book was actually published last month. It was initially written only in Germany, in German. However, an English edition will be published next year. We thank the organizers of this conference for giving us the opportunity to present this new book today in a special session. Karl Christian von Weizsäcker and I would also like to thank our two colleagues, Peter Bofinger and Eckhart Hein, for accepting our invitation to comment on our book today. Peter Bofinger is professor of economics at the University of Würzburg in Germany, a long-standing but now former member of the German Council of Economic Advisors, and one of the key speakers at today's plenary session as well. Eckhart Hein is professor of economics at the Berlin School of Economics and Law, longtime organizer of the FMM conference series, author of numerous publications in the field of post-Keynesian and neo keynesian theory, and a longtime friend of mine. We have agreed on the following schedule for this session. First, Kai Christian von Weizsäcker will present central theoretical concepts and basic results of the book. Then I will give an overview of the empirical basis and the most important results on the size and structure of private wealth. Next, the two commands on the book will be given. First, Peter Bofinger, and then by Eckhart Hein. The authors together have 40 minutes to present, and the critics have 20 minutes each to praise the book or to destroy it as they like. After that, the authors have the opportunity to give some answers to the criticism. In the remaining time of the session, we would like to have a general discussion with the audience. By the way, you may have noticed the session will be streamed live on the internet, so if you participate, the organizers will assume that you agree when you are filmed. Before handing over to Karl Christian von Weizsäcker, I would like to point out that this session on our book has many direct implications for the main theme of this conference, 20 Years of Euro. One of the political recommendations of the book is the abolition of the government debt break, which Germany, for example, included in its constitution 10 years ago. Such a fiscal rule endangers the existence of the single currency area in Europe. Instead, as a first step, we propose an interest current account contract for the Eurozone instead and ultimately for the entire developed world. But now, the basic theoretical approach, the main findings, and some policy conclusions of our book will be presented. I now give the floor to Karl Christian von Weizsäcker. Thank you. Thank you very much to the organizers that we are allowed to present uh, to advertise our book. And uh, as Hagen already has said, I will do a little bit of uh, theory and then he will do quite a bit of empirical research, <clears throat> which is contained in the book. The reason that I proceed, as, as you will see, is that it's very easy. It's not very difficult. And 
basically we do not need very complicated uh, <coughs> formulas. This is the, uh, <coughs> the book, and <coughs> we emphasize the subtitle, The Great Divergence. Actually, I believe we have agreed that in the English version, The Great Divergence will be the main title. This uh, is <coughs> the distribution of private wealth in the area of the OECD countries plus China, which is uh, close to three billion people. And we have three categories. I will not explain why we have three categories. It is being explained in the book of <coughs> wealth. They are real capital, buildings, machines, and so on, and valuations on the stock market, then land, and in, uh, land in general, but it turns out empirically that most of the land part is uh, urban land, like for example here in Berlin, uh, the land on which this building is built. And <clears throat> the third is net public debt. That is um, <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> excess of public debt over what the citizens owe to the government. And as you can see, our estimate for, for the year 2015 implies that almost half of private wealth consists of net public debt. Details will come from Hagen Kamer. Now, <clears throat> what we have done is um, we have looked at the relation or the coefficient between wealth in the numerator and income or consumption in the denominator. Now, this, or uh, in fact, uh, or for the production sector, capital used um, divided by output per year. Now, if you divide a stock by a flow, the magnitude which comes out has dimension time. And this is um, <clears throat> then our bridge towards our approach, which looks as if it were Austrian. Uh, the founder of this kind of analysis is uh, Eugen von Bembawerk, who in his book in the year 1889 um, uh, tried to explain why the rate of interest is positive. This I don't uh, repeat here. But one of the concepts which he used is the period of production. And we use this period of production as developed or invented by Böhm Bawerk, but as modernized by John Hicks in his famous book, Value and Capital, um, 50 years later, in the year 1939. <clears throat> the period of production is the following. Assume you have a fully vertically integrated hypothetical firm Axle firms are never fully vertically integrated. So this is a hypothetical firm which is representative of the economy at large. So you can imagine the economy as consisting of a set of overlapping fully vertically integrated firms. Later on we talk about overlapping generations which is a concept which is familiar to you. And similarly here, overlapping vertically integrated uh, hypothetical firms, fully vertically integrated. That is, they don't buy goods from the outside. They only buy labor from the outside, and they only sell consumption goods to the outside. No intermediate goods. And then TC, and uh, this firm, of course, has a time extension. And in this time extension, there is a flow 
of consumption goods and there is a flow of labor inwards. And now you can ask the question, how is it distributed, distributed over time? And take the labor inputs first, TL, which is then I call the time center of gravity of the flow of labor inputs. If you look at it as, as if it were a, a probability distribution, then the time, uh, time center of gravity is the mean of that distribution in terms of time units. And the same you can do with uh, the flow of consumption. And now you subtract the time center of gravity uh, of labor inputs from the time center of gravity of uh, consumption good outputs. And um, the difference between the two we call the period of production. And it turns out this is very much intrinsically related to the amount of capital which this um, uh, economy uses. Indeed, in a steady state model with a growth rate, G, and with a rate of interest, R equal G, uh, which is the golden rule path, um, capital per, wor per worker is given by the equation V equals the period of production times the annual consumption. We multiply a flow with a time unit and this then uh, generates a stock. And this we can derive in a very general model as long as there is a, a steady state. And I call this the bohm barbeck equation. This is what uh, bohm barbeck was really after. Now he didn't know mathematics, so it was difficult uh, for him to develop these things in a, in a uh, way which is easy to read. Higgs knew a little bit more mathematics and he modernized it, uh, and I have modernized it again uh, in 1971 uh, in my book on steady state capital theory. Now, uh, the other time uh, uh, magnitude uh, is the wealth income or the wealth consumption ratio. I call it Z. <clears throat> and the waiting, uh, and I call it the waiting period. Now, you are familiar with the overlapping generations uh, approach uh, model. And <clears throat> For a particular person, you look at the flow of consumption the person consumes, and you look at the flow of wage income the person earns from uh, supplying labor on the labor market. And again, you can do the same time center of gravity um, for consumption, ZC, and time center of uh, gravity of the flow of wage income, ZL, <coughs> uh, of a worker who is representative of, for the economy at large. In, in this very simple uh, uh, <coughs> description, I work uh, with the uh, figure of the representative <coughs> uh, consumer. Uh, actually, if you are interested to go into more detail, uh, and our book is accompanied by a manuscript of mine, which actually is written in English, called Capital Theory of the Steady State, which is about 100 pages, and quite a bit of mathematics in it, uh, where you then can see how this generalizes if we uh, relax the assumptions which I just have made, namely R equal G and so on. But the basic result uh, remains the same, even then. <clears throat> now, in a steady state model with a growth rate G and with a rate of interest R equal to G, that is the golden rule path which we mentioned before, we can derive that the private wealth per worker is equal to this waiting period, that is the average time distance between earning income and spending it on consumption times the annual consumption in this steady state. 
So we have the equation here that wealth is, um, uh, this is wealth, and it consists of three components. Uh, remember the picture which we had at the beginning. This is real capital. C times L is the value of land. You need to go to the microphone. Oh, yeah. Uh, and um, C times D is public debt. Debt is the debt period, so to speak, uh, uh, similar to uh, the debt um, <clears throat> quota as, as they are mentioned uh, in actual politics. Now we divide the, this equation by C, and then we get Z is equal to T plus L plus D. Now, remember, this is an equilibrium condition. This is not an identity, it's an equilibrium condition. Z is what people want to have in terms of wealth relative to consumption. And the right-hand side is what they, in which way they can uh, um, hold this wealth. If these two um, variables are uh, different, if, this, uh, if there is an inequality, then you have a cyclical problem. If Z is larger than the right-hand side, you have a downturn of the economy. If Z is um, <clears throat> lower than the right-hand side, uh, you tend to have inflation. All this under conditions of full, full employment, by the way. Now, if we look at the, at the numbers, we see that T is basically without a trend. Here we give a figure which is in the book, which is the capital output ratio of the United States of America. And you can see over the time from 1945, the end of the uh, Second World War, until to, to now, there is no trend in it. There are uh, certain variations which are due to cyclical movements. I don't go into the detail here. On the other hand, Z, that is the amount of wealth people want to hold relative to their annual consumption, is, uh, has an upward trend. And the main reason for this upward trend is that they live longer and longer. Life expectancy rises through um, secularly. It was much lower in the 19th century than in the 20th century, and it will be much higher in the 21st century as compared to the 20th century. The arrow shows where we are just now. This curve gives a world average life expectancy of the world population. Not only the area we are looking at, China plus OECD, but the total world. And this is a, a curve which uh, you can download from the United Nations uh, population division would do these forecasts. Today, world life expectancy is around 70 years. They forecast that at the end of this century, that is 2100, it will be uh, by, uh, at uh, roughly 83 years. That is 13 years more than just now. <clears throat> and this means unless people work longer uh, in tandem with their uh, increasing life expectancy that they need more and more reserves for their old age relative to their annual consumption. And this, of course, will be the case. We can be quite sure that the retirement age will not keep up in terms of one-to-one -one with um, life expectancy and therefore the retirement period, the average retirement period, period in the world will rise, uh, continue to rise. It has risen in the past and will continue to rise. <clears throat> now, given that we want to have full employment, therefore the equation Z equals L plus D plus uh, V uh, plus um, uh, T, uh, we need and T doesn't grow, 
I don't have the time to explain why tea will not grow in the future. Uh, we, will, um, uh, we will have to have a secular growth of L plus D. Now, for reasons which, for reasons of time, I cannot go into, uh, the growth of L will not uh, will stop at some time, at some point. Remember that L is um, mainly urban land. Now, the price of land in Berlin depends on something like legislation in terms of rent control. And just now, you, can, you, you know that the government of Berlin, or the uh, parliament of Berlin, has decided that uh, rents are no longer allowed to rise for, for residential um, <clears throat> houses, and therefore, this will have a dampening, dampening effect on the value of land here, because the owner of the land uh, will uh, have to do, uh, will no longer uh, expect, or will, will tend not to expect any more uh, increasing rental income. Uh, therefore, D has to rise, which is the uh, public debt. Um, uni uh, per, per unit of consumption. And public debt needs to be steered between two uh, dangers, namely if it is too, too low, this tends uh, to make um, <coughs> Z larger than the right-hand side, and therefore you will tend to have uh, a problem of insufficient demand, Keynesian problems, or if uh, public debt is too high, uh, um, <clears throat> you uh, come into the danger of that uh, uh, investors no longer trust the government. And therefore, uh, you have to steer uh, this uh, very um, carefully. This is a, uh, a picture from the book, and therefore it's in German. Which, uh, which shows the relation between the public debt, D, and the equilibrium rate of interest. If public debt, D, is very high, and ignoring for the moment that uh, perhaps uh, people become afraid of not being paid when they buy um, uh, government bonds, uh, it means that less of wealth is available for um, the other two investments, and therefore uh, the rate of interest will be higher. So we have a positive relation between the equilibrium real rate of interest uh, and uh, public debt. And we are now at this point that uh, the real rate of interest basically is zero, and therefore um, <clears throat> we are at the juncture between what I call the Friedman world and I, what I call the Keynes world. The Friedman world it, it has been uh, existed in the past. Uh, Milton Friedman suggested flexible exchange rates between the different uh, currencies of the different countries, and this worked quite well uh, in large parts of the after-war period up until uh, <clears throat> uh, the 90s. And uh, whenever some, some, a country had a problem of insufficient demand, it si simply could lower, the central, the central bank could lower the rate of interest and thereby stimulate investment. And on the other hand, if a country had a problem with inflation, the central bank could, could raise the rate of interest in order to dampen demand and thereby dampen inflation. And this worked well. It no longer can work well if uh, the real rate of interest now is at zero or tends to become negative because then the central bank, and this is what we observe every, every day, Mr. Draghi's problem now for quite a while, <clears throat> that he's no longer able to reduce the rate of interest very much and uh, has to develop all kinds of instruments uh, uh, to overcome this problem. But of course, um, uh, very much can no longer be done here 
And this has an implication for the moods of the, the mood of the people. And my explanation of uh, the fact that Mr. Trump has been elected President of the United States three years ago and has a chance of being re-elected in a year's time uh, is uh, that we are in the Keynes world now. And therefore, people are afraid or people see that jobs are, uh, are scarce or at least scarce in, around their, uh, where they live. And this leads to protectionism. So the political economy of protectionism is very much related to capital theory, which so far economics has not taken up. And we have taken this up in our chapter 10 and 11. Uh, the chapter 11 is on the euro. The chapter 10 is on Mr. Trump. And there you can read this. Um, <clears throat> uh, this also means that if you look at the diplomacy of world trade, it will not be possible to maintain a high balance of payment surplus for Germany. So the problem of sufficient employment in Germany will have to be solved in different ways. Thank you very much. Okay, my job now is to uh, give you a brief overview about basic empirics that are in included in the book and also say some words to our mythology on that and give you uh, some uh, ideas about basic concepts and data sources that we used. Um, let me start with explaining to you that we wanted to make a calculation or a broad estimation of one, the volume of private wealth and also the structure of private wealth private wealth. The private sector is defined as the sum of private households, including non-profit institutions serving households, and private corporations. Please beware that private corporations in the end are owned by private households. So it's legitimate to sum up the value of these two uh, sectors. They have to be aggregated. Uh, we are interested for theoretical reasons. Christian Weizsäcker gave some explanations before on stock variables, so asset value at a point of time, and our reference year where data permits is always the year 2015. We looked at a rather large area of 35 countries. These were the 35 OECD countries in the year 2015, plus China, which uh, you can imagine was quite a challenge in regards to data availability, but I think we did our best on that. Uh, what was very, very helpful is the revision of the system of national accounts, so we could use a lot of data from statistical uh, sources, from official statistics. So the system of national accounts, the uh, latest revision of 2008, and then the European system of national European system of national accounts that was introduced in 2010 was very helpful in that we have now sectoral and macroeconomic balance sheets. We have new data on pension schemes. I will say a few words on this in a second. And of course, there are um, many many data from international organizations like the OECD, World Bank, IMF, and easy access today through data banks. We use that for aggregate consumption figures, for trade figures, and for the net international investment position, and some more. And finally, a very important source was the world, world inequality uh, database. Now let me start with uh, a brief um, explanation why we looked at the area OECD plus China. Well, for theoretical reasons, it's important to state or to assume that this is more or less a closed economy. Um, and I think we can also show that it has, on average, approximately a balanced trade or a balanced current account vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. 
Is this the case, the area would also have a balanced capital account vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. For an economic area with a balanced current and capital account, the stock of foreign claims is the same as the level of the stocks of foreign liabilities. This assumption is relevant in our context because in this case, the desired wealth of the citizens of the OECD plus China area can only be realized within the OECD plus China area itself. With other words, there's no way to get rid of national saving surpluses through capital exports, as for instance a country like Germany likes to do. In order to check whether the OECD plus China group of countries has balanced trade vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, we need to determine the bilateral trade relations of the 35 countries among themselves and of each of them with the rest of the world, which was quite a lot of data calculation this was, was necessary. It would have made sense to conduct an investigation of the basis of current account balances, of course, but the data needed to do this is not available for all countries of the OECD plus China, China area, and this is why we had to focus on trade balances instead. The result of these calculations is represented in this figure, which shows the balance of trade of the OECD plus China area with the rest of the world between 1995 and 2011. Under that period here, the balance of trade with this area with uh, the rest of the world was on average 0.25% 0 of gross domestic product of this economic area. Due to incompleteness of data, it is not possible to undertake a similar analysis of the net foreign asset position of the OECD plus China area vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. We can thus only present the aggregate net international investment position of this area against the rest of the world. And the chart you can see here in that period, 1991 to 2016, we find for this area a fluctuating and apart from two years, consistently negative balance of the aggregate net foreign asset position of around minus 4.8% of GDP on average, which is not zero, but it's not very large. So although we cannot make an exact judgment, but only approximate judgment, we conclude from these analysis of the data that the OECD plus China area is relatively closed vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Let me repeat the conclusion of that. The statistics show that the rest of the world does not represent an outlet for possible surplus savings of the OECD plus China area. This is quite important. Now Christian von Weizsäcker has already shown you this pie chart which gives uh, our estimations of the composition of the components of private wealth and also the magnitudes which we see here. Um, if you look at that, you might ask the question why there is no financial wealth of the private sector, with the exception of claims of the private sector against the state. Well, first, all domestic claims and liabilities within the private sector cancel out. And second, since we analyze a closed economy, there is no such thing as net foreign assets. Therefore, there remain only non-financial assets, like capital and land, and the claims of the private sector against the state, which we call explicit and implicit government debt. This is equal to the total claims of the private sector vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the government. Let me now briefly give you a little overview on two components, real capital and uh, government debt. I'll leave out land for uh, reasons of time. Well, real capital is machinery and equipment, buildings and inventories. And private wealth by, owned by corporations is included in our estimate and then allocated um, to shareholders. With our data, we follow the conceptions of the world inequality database approach. They include 
Tobin Q values into the estimate of real capital. Many of you might be familiar with the World Inequality Database as a very uh, valuable source of inequality data on many countries and many fields. However, they started, they, I mean, Piketty and Zuckman, started actually with um, creating wealth figures for different countries um, as research that previous researchers ha had done and then came up to also the distribution of wealth. But it's also a very rich source for um, uh, wealth data, especially for real uh, capital. Data for 20 of our countries was available here in this database, and the rest we tried to take from official statistics or made some approximations to transfer the results on an average basis to the other countries that were remaining. Um, Karl Christian von Weizsäcker also mentioned Tobin's Q briefly, this was the biggest challenge here since we wanted to include the market value of companies and not the book values. And Piketty and Zuckman make clear in their publications and all in the manual to this database that their concept is of market wealth of companies and market uh, wealth is also included here. So this was our database. This is one of the tables uh, taken from the book. We had to make some simplifications and also some other uh, calculations, so to call it, around to corner to arrive finally at real capital. One example is that we also wanted to include um, uh, durables, uh, consumer durables, like uh, cars and, I don't know, big TV screens and all what a household has today to include this in private wealth, which is not in the uh, World Inequality Database, so we took this from uh, of official statistics. We calculated the value of real capital stock of each country for 2015, and then divided this international dollar value by the sum of private and public consumption to reach at this variable. Uh, von Weizsäcker explained already uh, everything is referred to the sum of consumption, private and public consumption. In sum, the value of real capital in the OECD was approximately 3.6 years of consumption in 2015, and in the OECD plus China area, it was uh, roughly four years of consumption. Government debt. Well, we are all aware of what we call explicit, explicit government debt, which we defined as the net financial government debt, not the gross value most of you see and use in statistics, but net because also the government has some claims uh, towards the private sector, so this is the net of the explicit debt. But what's it's more interesting and more important, as we could show, is what can be called implicit debt, mainly pensions in national uh, pensions of the private sector and we have capital value of pension entitlements and social ex, uh, insurance as the most important sector and we were very lucky because since december 2018 eurostat published uh, the data of calculation which come from the uh, european union member states and some others so we could use official data on pension entitlements, which represent uh, present values calculated um, with actuarial uh, methods. Um, you can look at that at the Eurostat website if you want. And just a brief explanation, this is new in the European system of national accounts, there is a recommendation for all member states to add a supplemental table that includes pension outside the main tables of the previous national accounts, and they calculate this to, with a so-called accrued to date method, pension entitlements and social insurance of the private sector and also of government employees, and for example for Germany, Beamtenansprüche are also included in that. So this is the present value of pension entitlements, which we have here. Here is the original table. We used it for our purposes in a, a certain way. I do not want to go into details here, but mention one important thing. 
you have to assume a certain interest rate, discount rate, to calculate here the present value. And in the base scenario of the Eurostat calculation, they used a present uh, a discount rate, I'm sorry, an interest rate of real 3%. They also, and this is according to the rules of the SNA, they had to do a sensitivity analysis with a discount rate of minus 1% of the base scenario and another one of plus 1%. But in our world, of course, we're interested in a scenario with zero interest rate. So what we did is was our own extrapolation to calculate the present value with zero interest, a rather uh, complicated mathematical system. But then finally we arrived uh, of uh, government debt in years of consumption, and I just give you, uh, due to time restrictions, uh, the results here. You can see that private wealth based on pension entitlements and social insurance makes up around five years of consumption in the OECD and China area. I don't know whether you're able to read the small figures. Um, the reason I decided to present this table here is that you are now forced to buy the book to read the figures in detail. And then you can see that the difference between the countries are quite large. For example, Canada and Denmark, uh, there, this implicit government debt is below one year of consumption. In France, it's about nine years. And in Germany, it's almost seven years. This can partly explain by the role and extent of private pension schemes. But note, even the US down here uh, below in the table has an implicit government debt due to pension entitlements and social insurance of about uh, 3.9 years. These are our estimations, we have to admit, because the United States, Japan, Canada, some others are behind the plan. They should publish also this pension entitlements according to the system of national accounts. And the OECD has promised, or all OECD members have promised to uh, provide these uh, tables. But they are a little bit behind Eurostat. And we hope to see the new data before our book uh, will appear in, uh, in English uh, next year. So we could come up with more of official figures. I come to the end. The summary of our empirical estimations is put together in this overview table. In the left-hand side, the columns here present calculations of the value of uh, real capital land and government debt with a positive interest rate of around 3%. And what is our final result is in the right-hand col column, the wealth of the private sector in these three composite forms at zero interest. And this was in some more than 13 times the level of annual private and public consumption. Of these 13 consumption years, more than six years are in the form of net public debt. Explicit debt makes up only 12% of government debt. The tip of the iceberg, 78%, 87%, I'm sorry, is implicit. The remaining seven years are real capital and land, the latter mainly urban land, as was mentioned already. Put differently, real capital accounts for one-third, land amounts of one-fifth, and net public debt constitutes almost half of private wealth. This is the result of our empirical estimations. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Peter Bofinger is next. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this book. This is a great, fascinating book, and I want to congratulate the authors if they listen uh, to, this, to this book. I think you've really done a great job with this book. Uh, it is impressive. It has a very broad and strong theoretical framework. At the same time, it has very clear uh, policy implications. And as this book is so comprehensive, I want to say from the very outset, uh, with my short comments, I cannot do justice to the whole book. I can only address some aspects. So the authors, please forgive me if I do not uh, address everything 
uh, that this book uh, contains. And let me also say from the very beginning, I share above all the policy conclusions of this book. I fully agree uh, that we need public debt, that we need higher public debt. And uh, I sometimes say if the whole world adopted the black zero of Germany, the world economy would end up in a black hole. So that's definitely clear. Uh, but the question is, and that then leads me now to my short comments, the question is what kind of debt do we need? Do we need explicit or implicit debt? If we say we need government debt, we need more government debt, what kind of debt do we need? Uh, and the, I think this is not trivial. Yeah? But OK, so let's, let me start. Uh, as far as I understand uh, the book, the main argument is there's, uh, there's an increasing supply or supply for capital due to demography and increasing wealth. So the private households want to have more and more uh, capital, that's a Z if I really understand it, but the demand for capital due to uh, additional complexity and, and, and uh, which is needed in the production process is relatively stable and how to fill this gap, how to deal with these divergence, we, there's the, the, the state, the government has to fill, fill this gap, otherwise we end up in deflation and, and uh, we get a negative real interest rate. So this is my view, the main argument and the main chart you have seen already is this what, what you have just presented? So, okay, this is the share of, of this is private wealth and how it is structured, and most of it is, is, is uh, this kind of uh, pension uh, entitlements. There's land, and, and there's also little, some real capital. So, I did not have the time now to, to make the same calculation. We have done a huge job to, to, to get, uh, get all this data. So, I've done something different. I look in the household and consumption survey of the ECB. ECB is, is doing this survey every, every third or fourth year, fourth year, and look how does it look like. So this is structure of household wealth in the euro area according to, the, to this household and financial, uh, uh, and fi household finance and consumption survey by the ECB. There you can see, first of all, well, the poor guys, they don't have very much wealth. I think that's the same thing in Germany. The lower 50% of the population have almost no wealth. Let's put it bluntly. Uh, so there are these, all these arguments do not play a role. And then the interesting thing is, well, the main, main those who are wealthy, most of their wealth is, is their own house and real estate. So that's almost all the wealth that they have. And um, there's a little bit of uh, finance, other assets, and, and uh, it's, it's not that much because the uh, financial assets and the mortgages somehow add up. Uh, in, in the, uh, for, for the households. And, and so, yeah, what does it show us? It shows that obviously housing and real estate matter a lot for households. And the question is, is this really addressed in your, in your uh, view of, of the world? You speak about real capital and you have land, but of course housing matters a lot. And if you say housing matters, um, this also helps you a little bit to fill your diversions because if people have their own houses, they're bigger, if they're more wealthy, they have bigger houses. If they live longer, they can live longer in their houses. So, and so the housing wealth is, in my view, something which is not, does not really, to which your divergence doesn't really apply yeah, because it has nothing to do with technical processes. People can have long, bigger houses, they can live longer in their houses. And there's no technical constraints, so to say, where okay, this, this kind of real capital cannot grow. Yeah, so housing wealth can grow a lot. Yeah, and so I, I think a major part of the divergence can be taken away saying, just look at housing. Where's, where's the problem? Yeah, and, and that's definitely what most, what most people uh, have in there, uh, what, what, what makes up the wealth of, of, most, of most people. So I think that's one argument I would, would, with which, I, with which I would a little bit question your, um, uh, yeah, your, your analysis would say, if you take this into account, there's much less of a divergence than, than you would say. Now, but looking at this, at this data, you would say, well, um, where, is, where, is, uh, where are the, uh, the, the entitlements uh, from, the, from, from the pensions of these people? Isn't that also part of the household wealth? It, this plays in your book a uh, very important role. Say this, this, uh, Pension entitlements, uh, this is, this is a, yeah, almost 50% of the household wealth. But the question is, are these 
entitlements that I have in the pay-as-you-go system, is this really wealth of the household sector? Is this really wealth, for, for the, not for the individual household, but on aggregate, is this really wealth? And I, w I would say, if you, if you make a balance sheet for the government sector and for the pr private, for the household sector, um, <coughs> you can say, okay, what you do, you say, we have this implicit debt from pay-as-you-go system, pension payments in the future. This is the debt of the government, and you say it's the asset of the private sector. But if you take this perspective, you say, okay, we, we have to put in the balance sheet all the payments the government has to make for pensions. Then the question is, don't we also have to use in this balance sheet all the, uh, the, 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 the payments that the government receives? from the social security systems. Why, why, do not, why do you not balance both streams? There's one stream the government has to pay, but there's the other stream, the social security contributions over the next 50 or 100 years, and you have to, do, if, if you have this kind of implicit perspective, I would say both sides have to be booked, and then the whole thing balances. And of course, the logic from a pay-as-you-go system is the households pay into the pay-as-you-go system, and they receive uh, money from the pay-as-you-go system, and if the pay-as-you-go system functions normally, what flows in is the same thing that must flow out. If you don't have any, if, if, if it's a balanced pay-as-you-go system. And so I don't see any reason why these payments into the pay-as-you-go system and the payments from the pay-as-you-go system should be regarded as, as wealth of the household. Because it's the households that pay in and the households that receive the money. And so I, I don't think that this is really uh, wealth of the, of the private sector, which is something that stands against debt of the government. So that would be my main concern with this, with this uh, perspective. For the individual household, it's true, yes. For each individual household, say, okay, I pay in, and when I, get, when I grow old, when I get old, hopefully I get something out. Yeah, but on aggregate perspective, I really doubt whether this is the right the right perspective to look at the things. But it's not so, but, but even if you say no, this, we don't believe, we don't, we don't want to see it like this. Uh, nevertheless, all, all, your, all your books uh, circles around this pay as you go system. This is really what is in the focus of the system. The question is, do we really have problems when people get older with the pay as you go system? I would say no. So if households live longer, they can also work longer. It doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. Yeah, that's, that's not necessary. But if it's about, I think at the council, we have calculated uh, each year people, uh, the life expectancy grows. It's sufficient if for each year of additional life, a third of a year is additional working time. That's enough. Yeah? And, and I, 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 I'm convinced that people will uh, work longer in the future. Uh, already we have made it from 65 to 67. And why not in 2070 people work until 69? I think the discussion to now is absurd. The discussion that we have on this topic today is absurd. I couldn't imagine a more absurd discussion about than discussing when people who are now in their 20s will retire in 50 years. That's the most absurd discussion you can lead. Yeah, so it's, it's, but uh, all the people like Bundesbank, my colleagues in Suffolk, you know, they always like it. It's, with the same logic, you could say, you, guys, do you know in 2200, people will retire when they are 90? Yeah, but the same, same logic or <laughs> same basis is equally absurd. But if you say 2200, people work until they're 90, then the Bild Zeitung would write next day, people have to work until they are 90. Yeah, so I think all these debates are, are, are stupid. and. In 2045, you can still have a discussion. When will the people that will retire have, will have to retire in 2070 around? Do they have to work until they're 70, 69, 68? But this is a debate you can do in 25 years' time. But overall, I think in the pay, pay as you go system can really work uh, with, with a longer life expectancy. Uh, it's, it's a very nice, it's, the system is not affected by inflation, and the good, and what also matters, it does not guarantee fixed benefits. So it's not really debt in that sense. It's, 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 I, in my view, pay as you go system has more equity character. Because what you do when you pay in a pay as you go system, you get a share in the, in the labor incomes of the future. That's what you get. You don't, do not get a fixed, uh, 
uh, uh, payment, you, 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 you are, you, yeah, it's the share in the human wealth of the future. That's what you get when you invest in the pay as you go system. So I would say pay as you go system is more equity than, than debt, in my view. Anyhow, so it's completely disconnected from the capital stock, this pay as you go system, and people, especially when they're older, they don't need uh, products that come out of machines. They need, they need, uh, all kinds of, of services that have nothing to do with capital, so I think there's no, no connection to, um, to the capital stock. And what, I also, what also matter, it has nothing to do with the financial market. Yeah? So even if, you, if I share your view and say, well, it's debt, but this debt has nothing to do with the capital market. It's completely disconnected. There's no, no effect on, on the capital market. And it's even the other way around. So if you have an effective uh, pensions uh, pay-as-you-go system, people have to, need, have to save less for retirement. So overall, that's, that's how I see this. So I think this focus on the pay-as-you-go system as the main form of debt and, and the need for the, car, for the government to have debt, I, I think it's, it's not going in the, in my view, it's not really going in the right direction. So then the question still remains, why do we have so high fiscal deficits? Because what the authors ask for is something we have. Overall in the world, we have in most countries, we have high fiscal deficits. In the United States, in China, the, the total deficit, not the, ex, not the implicit, but the, if you add up the deficits of the central government and uh, the local governments, the deficit in China is about 12 percent, calculated by the IMF. So in, in India, in Brazil, all, many, many countries, the deficits are high. So what you ask for is there. Government deficits are high much higher, what I show here, than they were in, 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 in 2000, 2001. So, so what, what you ask for is something that we can see. Yeah? And the question is, but why, why are these deficits so high? Well, um, I always, sh I always share, with you, I share with you the view, this kind of balance, uh, balance sheet accountings. Of course, if you have these higher fiscal deficits, of course, the private sector must have more surpluses. Yeah? And so that's, that what you observe, that's what you can observe. Surpluses have increased in many countries. They have very high uh, fiscal, they have many private uh, surpluses. So if you look at, at the Netherlands of Ireland, of Switzerland, so many countries, we have now very high fiscal, high private surpluses. And they have very few countries where the private sector overall has a deficit. Yeah, so you can see this has shifted. But the question is now, these high financial surpluses, which is not saving, um, are they due to the fact that households are saving because of demographic reasons? Because one could say here, that's what, you, what, what, what the authors say, we have demographic effects and the households save more. And here, the, my view, interesting finding is household saving rates have declined almost everywhere compared to 2001. Household savings, that's a fascinating thing. In the whole world, also as societies grow older, household saving has gone down. And that's something you cannot get out of the discussion. It's so fascinating. Everybody says, why do we have so low interest rates? Because households grow older and they save more. No, it's not true. It's not that the households are saving, they're saving less. And it's not surprising because uh, we have the income distribution that has developed uh, in a negative way for most households, they cannot save. It's quite easy. Where should this, <laughs> the potential be for households to save? So they, they cannot save. And, but how do we get this together? We have, we have private surpluses, and we have um, declining uh, private saving. How, can we, how, how can, we, can we combine this? And the answer is obviously the corporate sector must, have, must make the saving. It's, now you can say, well, we simply add it up, we aggregate it, but this is, of course you can do it, <laughs> no problem, but the question, that's another logic, yeah, because these, the corporate saving, I would never talk about, one word which one really should forget in economics is the word savings, because it's completely flawed. Saving is a flow concept, yeah? and savings is something which does not exist. Just forget about the word, because savings has the association of a Stock concept. I have my savings with my savings, but this is not a correct economic term. Just forget it. Talk always about saving, which is a flow concept. Savings is if you meet somebody and say he or she has high savings, but it's not, not a technical term. Just forget about savings. And then if you, if, you, if, you, if you erase the word savings from economic literature, you get a very 
very positive cleaning, cleaning effect. Of course, you did it. No, of course. So, but the, the thing is, and, and, and to show this um, interplay between corporate saving and household saving, it's nice to look at Germany, where you can really see that very nicely. So in Germany, from 1991, household saving has remained almost constant, even gone down a little bit. So it's some little up, little down. And, and here you can say, also the economy is growing older, and also the pay as you go system has been reduced considerably. So in Germany, for the households, there would be, have been a strong need to save more, because much, they get much less out of the pay as you go system today than they, than they got in 99. But household saving has remained relatively constant. What has increased is corporate saving, and that has gone up a lot. But this saving are the, simply the profits of the companies, because that's what, what many of us complain. They have all of the last decades, uh, the distribution has turned negative for the households and positive for the corporate sector. And that's what you see. So here you can see the, the, the corporate saving, but this corporate saving has nothing to do with demography. Not at all. I think if I see our Mittelstand uh, uh, companies in Germany, the owners of, of these companies do not say we make more profits because we get older. No, that's not, obviously not the case. Obviously not the case. Yeah, they just they make profits because we make profits. Yeah, and and so, yeah, it's it's, it's not the demography story. But so let me end up with this. What does this show? Um, and I don't have data for the for the rest of the world. I think the high corporate saving is the reason why we need government debt, because this high corporate saving creates a gap in demand, because it's, it's, not, it's not invested, it's held in net financial assets, and that creates a gap in, in demand, and this gap is filled with government debt, but not with implicit debt, but with explicit debt. Yeah. So I would say, yes, we need government debt, but we don't need it because of private household saving due to demographics. We need it because of corporate saving, corporate profits, which are due to the income distribution, which has developed negative uh, for the households and positive for the corporations. But overall, let me end up with this. So I really share the overall idea that the government debt is definitely needed to stabilize the economy. Thank you very much. Watch is that? Yours? Can I use it? Okay, okay. Good. Oh, there, there are even two. Wow, great. <laughs> no Oops. Excuses. Uh, okay, well, you can give me an, an indication anyway. Okay, uh, first of all, I have to apologize. I don't have slides, so you have to listen to my words without being distracted uh, by the screen. Um, in uh, 2010, uh, Karl Christian von Weizsäcker had uh, the first publication of his approach in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is the main uh, German newspaper, I would say. And already then, I was very much impressed uh, by this approach, uh, coming to economic policy conclusions from a Austrian, neo-Austrian, post-Austrian perspective, which was similar uh, to the conclusions which many of us, many post-Keynesians, had come forward with as well. The argument was Germany needs more deficit, needs more debt uh, in order to balance the economy. In 2016, I already had the opportunity to comment on uh, von Weizsäcker's work at the uh, Science Center Berlin, um, where he gave a presentation on the global uh, social market economy and the migration crisis. Uh, and when Hagen Kremer, my long-term friend, uh, fellow student at the uh, progressive Reform University of Bremen in the late 1980s, uh, and now a post-Keynesian colleague told me that von Weizsäcker was preparing a full book on his approach together with him. I was surprised about this. Um, uh, I think then we would have called it antagonistic cooperation. So um, on the one hand, but on the other hand, I was also uh, very curious and excited to see the final results. And therefore, it's a great pleasure for me to comment on the book uh, on saving and investment in the 21st century here at this conference. As far as I see, the book has uh, uh, or contains four main contributions. The first one is 
a detailed elaboration of von Weizsäcker's uh, post or neo-Austrian view on saving and investment under the conditions of uh, a high equilibrium or natural rate of interest, that is what they call the Friedman world, uh, and under the conditions of low or even negative equilibrium uh, rates of interest, which they call the Keynes world. Uh, and it is argued that the latter is the world we are currently living in. The book also provides an empirical illustration on the uh, different stocks of private wealth, real capital, land, and net financial assets for the OC countries plus China. It contains a short uh, chapter on a or the Keynesian view on saving and investment and stagnation. And fourth, it derives the economic policy conclusions from uh, the post-neo-Austrian uh, view in general and for Germany and Europe in particular. In my comments, I will only focus on uh, a point or the contribution three and four. On the second contribution, the empirical illustration, I have nothing to comment because it seems to be thoroughly and consistently done, although one can, of course, discuss the treatment of implicit government debt. Um, so let me come to the first, the third, and the fourth contribution of the book. Uh, and let me start with uh, Christian von Weizsäcker's uh, post or neo-Austrian approach towards saving and investment. It has been explained here, so I don't have to repeat the details again. Um, so what seems to me, uh, for me, seems to be the core is, is that we have now a kind of mismatch of the uh, supply of uh, financial liabilities uh, and the demand for uh, financial assets and that the uh, equilibrium or natural rate of interest would, uh, or that th the two curves would intersect uh, in a territory with a, uh, negat a zero or negative uh, real rate of interest. So in other words, that the natural rate of interest is zero or even negative. From my perspective, and I think the reason why I was asked uh, to comment on the book is uh, not only to praise the book, but also to criticize a bit the theoretic foundations, from my perspective, uh, there are three problems involved here. So the first problem is, can we treat the real rate of interest as the adjusting variable? That is the old Cambridge-Cambridge controversy uh, and Srafa's uh, uh, convincing uh, uh, way of showing that in a more than one good economy, um, we run into serious problems. The second problem is the lack of monetary analysis, so that's the Schumpeter and Keynes argument. And the third point of critique is the neglect, more or less, of distributional issues. I call that the Kaletsky uh, and Steindl perspective, which is missing here. Now, the first point of critique, I don't think I have to fully explain this here in this audience. Uh, we know from the Cambridge controversies on the theory of capital that in a more than one good economy, we cannot rely on a smoothly downward sloping demand curve for capital um, 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 so that the uh, capital intensity of production is not a, uh, uh, um, um, a consistent function of the real rate of interest. Aggregate production functions with these properties are, that not, uh, are therefore not convincing from a theoretical pr perspective. And the same holds true, and I think that's my main argument here, for the choice of technique or the production period, which is important in von Weizsäcker's approach. So there is no, from a theoretical perspective, no systematic response towards changes in the real rate of, in rate of interest. So we cannot be sure that with a lower real rate of interest, methods of production turn out to be more capital intensive or more roundabout. That's my reading of the results of the Cambridge controversy. In the book, uh, in, on page 72, 73, you refer to good estimation uh, or good estimating properties of a neoclassical production function. That's not what you're using. You're using the Austrian approach, but nonetheless, you are referring to that. Um, but you uh, do not take, take into account that these estimating approaches or these estimating results uh, of aggregate production functions uh, are problematic too if we follow the work of Franklin Fisher, John McCombie, Jesus Felipe, and others because the data you uh, are using are based on accounting identities. At least they have to follow accounting um, conventions. From the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge capital controversy, we also know that consumption per head uh, and thus the supply of saving uh, or in stocks, the demand for uh, financial assets 
is also not a stable function of the real rate of interest. Therefore, it is problematic to talk about uh, a natural rate of interest, uh, the achievement of which is now blocked because uh, uh, it is uh, zero or, or negative. A second point is the Keynesian challenge. Uh, the Keynesian challenge uh, um, uh, arguing uh, or focusing on the adjustment of saving and investment in the monetary production economy and arguing that uh, it is a saving which uh, adjusts to investment through different channels. Uh, because investment can take place uh, without prior saving uh, in a uh, developed uh, in a world with a developed financial sector. And different from what I read from Chapter 7 of the book, uh, this is not only true for the short run, but it's also true for the, for the long run, as Joan Robinson has famously reminded us, saying, and I quote, the Keynesian models, including our own, so her own, are designed to project into the long period the central thesis of the general theory that firms are free within wide limits to accumulate as they please and the, that the rate of saving of the economy as a whole accommodates itself to the rate of investment that they decree. Um, these long-run macroeconomic adjustments of saving to investment occur via uh, different channels. So we have a channel through output growth and capacity utilization, which is the kalatsky steindl mechanism, or we have a channel through functional income distribution. That's the Caldor, Pazinetti, and Robinson tradition. Um, applying monetary analysis, um, the rate of interest becomes a monetary category, uh, which is exogenous to income generation and growth, as Pazinetti, for instance, has, has frequently argued. And uh, the rate of interest is thus determined by monetary factors, for instance, by central bank policies, liquidity preference of banks, and financial wealth holders. Currently, very low rates of interest in money and financial markets are thus not a, a result of uh, th are thus a result of these factors, um, but not a reflection of a low or zero equilibrium real rate of interest, as suggested by the authors. On the contrary, through different channels, distribution inv or investment, um, the monetary rate of interest rather affects than the rate of profit or the real rate of interest. Post Keynesians have provided several models for that for this, this, and I therefore uh, just refer to these. If you apply this perspective, then a careful analysis of the determinants of both saving and investment has to be provided in order to identify the causes of stagnative tendencies. These elements, and I just list them, uh, should include the involvement of animal spirits. Recently, we have in particular included the effects of financialization on management's desire to invest in the real capital stock. It has to include monetary variables, so the monetary rate of interest, credit availability. It has to include distributional variables, profits versus wages, but also retained earnings versus distributed, uh, distributed profits, so versus interest and dividends, and also wage dispersion and personal income distribution. It has to include the type of technological change, and most importantly, it has to include the stance of fiscal policies. Uh, here is not the place for me to present a detailed model. Uh, those of you have, who have been here at the 2015 uh, FMM conference, I've presented such an approach based on Steindl's notion of stagnation policy, and there are two papers which have been derived from that. The policy conclusions which I draw in the latter paper um, nonetheless have something in line with the policy conclusions which uh, emanate from the von Weizsäcker uh, Kremer approach. Uh, in the latter paper, which is focusing in particular on the policy implications for the Eurozone, I argue that uh, as a result, in order to avoid stagnation, um, the Eurozone in principle would have go for a policy mix in which central banks should target low long-term interest rates, they should take care of uh, financial stability, they should act as lender of last resort for the banking system, and most importantly, they have to guarantee member countries' government debt, uh, preventing nominal interest rates uh, from rising above trend rates of nominal GDP growth. Wage and incomes policies should target stable inflation uh, and stable functional income distribution, so wages should basically grow in line with the sum of the target rate of inflation plus long-run productivity goals. Most importantly, uh, regarding fiscal policies, the result is that governments should follow a kind of functional finance approach, 
targeting f uh, government financial balances which compensate for private sector financial balances. So government uh, expenditure minus taxes should be equal to private saving minus investment if we uh, go for a roughly balanced current account. Um, The suggestions regarding fiscal policy, uh, as you see, are fully in line with what has been presented here by von Weizsäcker and also fully in line, I guess, with what uh, Peter Buffinger has just mentioned. Um, however, again, I think there is a difference between the post-Keynesian approach I would propose and the, uh, at least my reading of the book, Chapter 6, six uh, Part 2, when it comes to the question who is responsible for the sustainability of the emanating government debt. Uh, in my post-Keynesian view, this would, be, uh, had, would have to be based on the cooperation between governments and central banks, uh, central banks targeting uh, rates of interest on government debt of the member countries uh, which should not uh, uh, rise above. Uh, long-term uh, growth rates in order to uh, not force government into running uh, um, primary surpluses in order to service their debt. In the book, I rather read that this is the responsibility of the individual government. So I, I there see a bit of a contradiction, or at least uh, a difference. Let me come to the Keynesian analysis in the book, which we find in Chapter 7. As I said, uh, this chapter seven contains the or a, the German title is not clear in this respect, Keynesian perspective on investment saving uh, and stagnation. Um, this is rather a short chapter, uh, so that in the book, the two approaches are rather treated somewhat asymmetrically. Um, as uh, in, in the chapter, we find the basic repetition of macroeconomic and financial accounting uh, and it explains the adjustment of saving and investment in Keynes, um, in particular uh, arguing that it is not via the rate of interest but through the level of income. Um, however, uh, the main characteristics of Keynes' alternative theory of the rate of interest in the book remain somewhat vague. Uh, but anyway, uh, in this framework, long-run stagnation and unemplo uh, unemployment problems arise if the desire to save at full employment income levels exceeds the de desire to invest, um, a long-run perspective which Keynes had put forward in his long-term problems of full employment. However, my impression is that in this chapter, uh, Keynes is, or Keynes' analysis uh, seems to be treated as a rather short-run comparative static analysis focusing on flow equilibria. This is of course true for the general theory and I would not contest that. That's the reason why the authors then continue with uh, reviewing, or yeah, the authors continue with reviewing Hansen's theory of secular stagnation and then come to Summers' uh, revival or rediscovery of the secular stagnation hypothesis. But in Summers, as we know, it is again um, the, uh, or at the core of Summers' approach, we can have a negative equilibrium real rate of interest which cannot be reached and which causes the problem of stagnation. Um, although in the later um, uh, publications by, by Rachel and Summers, uh, the terminus natural real rate of interest is replaced by a neutral uh, real rate of interest, uh, I would argue uh, this is still based on a neoclassical concept which is rather closer to von Weizsäcker's neo-Austrian concept than uh, representing a Keynesian approach. Uh, furthermore, and I have to say this, unfortunately, I was puzzled a bit that the authors avoided any systematic discussion of post-Keynesian distributional growth theory in the tradition of the two strands of post-Keynesian theory which I've already mentioned earlier, so the caldor pasinetti robinson strand and the Kaletsky and Steinl uh, tr uh, strand. Uh, the same holds true for modern contribution, contributions based on uh, these approach, approaches. Um, there is, are a few references, partly in footnotes, to Tom Pally's work and also to my own work, uh, but I would argue that a more elaborate treatment of, of these approaches and other post-Keynesian approaches would have avoided the current theoretical uh, imbalance of the book and would have allowed probably for a more systematic comparison of the different theoretical approaches. Let me come to the last contribution, uh, economic policy. Um, in uh, chapter 9, um, 9 to 13, it is argued that um, market economies 
in limits need the redistribution of income, and thus they need a welfare state, uh, in particular for retirees. They need price stability and full employment. And this, I think it was already mentioned in the presentation by the authors, should then be achieved by a stability pact between the state and the people. Uh, because, according to, to the authors, we are in the Keynesian world. The natural rate of interest is negative. This can only be achieved then if, or can only be stabilized if the government runs appropriate deficits and debt. Um, at an international level, we also propose uh, in order to maintain free trade and reap the benefits from the International Division of Labor and in order to avoid uh, tendencies to, uh, towards protectionism, severe current account imbalances uh, need to be adjusted, so the authors argue, and therefore they propose an international fiscal order, um, which means internationally coordinated fiscal policies or a multilateral agreement on financial balances. Um, this means, according to their view, that countries with low real uh, interest rates and current account surpluses should increase government deficits and debt, and thus their imports, thereby reducing their current account surpluses. Countries with high real interest rates and current account deficits should reduce government deficits and debt, and, th and thus their imports, thereby reducing their current account deficit. Real interest rates would adjust. Um, so the rise in the current account surplus and the fall in the current account deficit uh, uh, in this process of adjustment of current accounts, sorry. Um, this type of adjustment, without the real interest rate of adjustment, of course, because post Keynesians do not believe in uh, the idea of a equilibrium real rate of interest or a natural real rate of interest, this type of adjustment is what post Keynesians have suggested to um, uh, at several places. Um, In these recommendations, the aim is also, and I repeat what I've also generally suggested, to aim at government deficits or surpluses to compensate for private sector surpluses or deficits at non-inflation and full employment, le uh, employment level, levels and roughly balanced current accounts. Chapter 11 is criticizing the German current account surplus position in the Eurozone, which is undermining the stability of the Euro, and they also propose also within the Eurozone to apply the same agreement on financial balances as the one they had suggested for the world economy. This means that national fiscal policies would have to be coordinated such that uh, internal current account imbalances in the Eurozone will be corrected and the Eurozone as a whole will move to, uh, from its current account surplus position towards a balanced current account with the rest of the world. This means, and I translate now, um, one size fits all regulations for the Eurozone. Member countries regarding government financial balances and debt as the Stability and Growth Pact or the Fiscal Compact would have to be overcome. The same is true for the German debt break, which also would have to be abolished or to be overcome. Um, all of this, again, is fully in line with what post Keynesians have suggested in order to cope with the Eurozone crisis and the imbalances for a long period of time. However, again, whereas uh, von Weizsäcker and Krämer argue that with such an agreement on financial balances, each member country should then be responsible for its fiscal solvency, post Keynesians have argued that the functional finance fiscal policy in each member country also needs the cooperation uh, with the ECB in order to protect member countries against financial market attacks and speculation. So that again refers to my general outline uh, on a post-Keynesian coordinated macroeconomic policy mix uh, in general. Furthermore, and this goes beyond I think what uh, the two authors have proposed in their book, uh, in order to deal with current account imbalances, um, post Keynesians have argued that it's not sufficient to adjust fiscal balances. It's not just not, not efficient to adjust um, the financial balances of the government in the way I've described. They have also argued that in order to uh, apply successful catching up in the periphery, we would also need further policy instruments like uh, industrial and regional policies in order to improve non-price competitiveness and growth and to eliminate uh, uh, or, or to take into account uh, growth differences and, and, and allow for catching up uh, of the periphery against the center. 
Finally, in Chapter 12, the notion of managing financial balances internationally is also applied to the development problem, and uh, the authors argue that catching up of developing countries should be associated with current account surpluses of the um, uh, catching up countries, and thus current account deficits of the developed capitalist world. This would then require even higher government deficits than the ones associated with a balanced current account in the developed economies. However, such a constellation, which means high growth rate plus current account surpluses in the catching up countries and low growth with current account deficits in the mature countries would require, at least in my view, a considerable real undervaluation of the catching up countries, um, high price elasticities of their exports and imports, and very low income elasticities of exports and imports. Only then will the growth differences associated with catching up have little or no effects on the current account balances. Looking at Thurwood's law, for instance, and the rich and empirical literature on this law, I have my doubts whether these conditions can be met in reality. Okay. Let me sum up. Yep, I'm, I'm almost done. Let me sum up. Uh, the two authors have published a thought-provoking book which deserves intense discussion and reception, both in the academic and the political arena. I've highlighted significant theoretical disagreement, in particular with von Weizsäcker's neo- or post-Austrian view, and also with the treatment of the Keynesian approach by the two authors. Um, I have also made clear that there is broad agreement between the authors um, and, and myself and maybe several other um, uh, Keynesians or post-Keynesians in the room on the role of fiscal policies for stabilizing international uh, national and international economies. Uh, so what currently is required, in particular in the mature capitalist economies, is a con uh, reconsideration of the role of fiscal policies, government deficits, uh, and government debt. With an excess of private saving over private investment at uh, non-inflationary full employment levels, compensating fiscal deficits and the related government debt are required if we want to avoid the present current account imbalances and if we want to stabilize full employment and constant inflation. Can this policy recommendation be wrong if it is derived from completely different competing theoretical foundations? Von Weizsäcker's uh, neo- or post-Keynesian approach, Summers' new Keynesian view, Kramer's or von Weizsäcker's uh, and Kramer's Keynes elaboration, and the post-Keynesian theory which I would, I would favor. I think it can't be fundamentally wrong because what unites all these approaches is that uh, all of them respect basic macroeconomic and financial stock and flow accounting relationships, irrespective of the respective theories about what precisely determines the behavioral equations in the model and what precisely is the equilibrating variable. That is why all these approaches come to the conclusion that if the private sector uh, wants to increase its holding of net financial assets and current account imbalances should be avoided, the counter part liabilities can only be issued by the government. I can only hope that in particular policymakers will not only hear but also listen to this fundamental message. Uh, the issues at stake are very serious, as the authors point out several times in the book. They are not only about macro, employment, inflation, and financial, financial stability. They are also about democracy, international cooperation, and maybe about peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Eckhart, for your valuable and interesting comments. They are all worth discussing. Um, we agreed on only 10 minutes uh, time for reply by the authors, so that we have also time to discuss with the audience. And I think, uh, Christian, are you going to start with some of your replies to the two comments? You want to start? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for, for the comments. Of course, uh, within four minutes, I cannot uh, go to all. <laughs> OK, well. <clears throat> so I want to concentrate on one issue on the theoretical side, which is really the uh, topic which both of you have mentioned the Cambridge-Cambridge controversy, which took place half a century ago. Um, 
In, in the paper, which is in English, which, uh, which uh, I wrote in parallel to, to the book, which I just uh, showed you in my talk, uh, which is uh, available on my homepage, I do what I call a steady state analysis. <clears throat> and I believe we need this because, of course, the world is very complicated. If you want to um, <clears throat> uh, develop a dynamic model, uh, taking account of all the uh, aspects which are uh, relevant in reality, <clears throat> uh, you have a big problem. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, one of the reasons why economists uh, quarrel with, with each other. But I think it is the case that a steady state analysis provides and this is uh, similar to what we know from the natural sciences. Equilibrium analysis, ecology, for example, uh, provide insight into the constraints which the dynamic models uh, develop. And this is the reason that I, I have concentrated on the steady state analysis. And if you do this, then you can show that quite a few of the points of con contention in the old Cambridge, Cam Cambridge controversy disappear. And the one which is particularly important here is uh, the issue whether the rate of interest has an allocative function, yes or no. Uh, the Cambridge UK um, <clears throat> Uh, part uh, tend to deny it, the uh, Cambridge MIT part, of which I am a part also, uh, tends to uh, say yes, it has an allocative function. If you take this further, then you can show that the question whether a rising rate of interest leads to uh, less capital or more capital uh, in, in the um, real capital uh, can be answered unambiguously. And the point by the Cambridge uh, School that um, due to the Vixel effect, um, the uh, rising rate of interest can go with a higher value of the capital used is uh, due, which, uh, which good theorists know, of course, due to the repricing effects, the relative pricing effects, if you uh, leave them out, if you only look at what happens in terms of changes in real, the real stock of capital, which is, of course, a very complicated thing, then you can show, and this is one of the reasons why I use the Austin approach, that the period of production keeping prices the same due to substitution declines as the rate of interest rises. This is what I call the uh, intertemporal substitution theorem. And I apply uh, or I develop a further concept of a substitution between capital and labor, which is not the elasticity of substitution, which, was, uh, which is being used when you use the solo production function. And this is what I call the coefficient of intertemporal substitution. And I think this is very fruitful because you then can also quantify this. You can find out how large it is if you do empirical work. And for example, it turns out that quite a few of the things which are really quite important are being neglected by the Keynesian schools as well as the neoclassical schools so far. This is in this paper. And um, so I think uh, I would stick, uh, without having the time developing it further, I would stick uh, to uh, the proposition that the real rate of interest has an important allocative function 
And if you do this, then quite a few of the conclusions which are in the book follow. That's it. Then I would like uh, to give a reply to Peter Buffinger's uh, empirical uh, argumentation. First thing, there will be a complete misunderstanding if we uh, forget to include house values into our analysis. These are included in the form of private capital. Land, you're right, is without buildings and residential structures, but this is included in real capital sector. But that's not what I mean. The question is whether divergence applies for household, household wealth. It's not that you have memory wrong, but the question is does the divergence apply if people can invest in housing wealth? Yes, I, 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 if you allow me. Um, perhaps I have had, still had one, one minute. Um, <laughs> if you take a well-paid worker in the car industry who owns a house, you can see that even if he can borrow money at zero interest, he will not buy a castle. He will restrain himself to as much as he considers is okay in a trade-off between other consumption goods and, and the size uh, of the house. And this is because um, every house implies a lot of maintenance costs. You, and you must dis, uh, distinguish between, um, in the flow terms, gross investment and net investment. Of course, if the rate of interest goes down, gross investment goes up. But from a certain point onwards, and this is what we argue in the book actually, uh, at some detail, at, from a certain point onwards, the additional gross output which you can generate by more, uh, applying more capital, more real capital, is outweighed by the maintenance cost, the additional maintenance cost. And therefore, it is not true that um, housing will grow as far, uh, as far as you want. Not as far as you want, but it's not limited by production processes. It is. It is. That's what I just said. People, uh, rather than buying a castle, they make uh, more, uh, they travel around in the world or do something else. They will not buy a castle. No, but, but they can buy a house in order to accommodate their need for additional wealth for retirement. That's what they can do. That's not really No, but that, that's what they will especially, not do this. Especially if they live longer. Your main argument is people live longer. That's why they need more wealth. But if the house, you can stay longer, no problem. No, but, but this is a misunderstanding of what, what people do, how, how people allocate their wealth. If they have the choice between a castle, which they later on are unable to sell because nobody wants to buy it, because it is too large and too expensive, or by government debt. It is clear that they were by government debt and not the house. But that's the German perspective. In, in all, most all countries, housing wealth is very high among the population, and 70, 80 percent of people live in their own house. It's only Germany where they have this, this strange preference for government debt. That's a very German perspective. Uh, well, we don't have the time, but I think you uh, Okay, I would make a remark to the also controversial issue of implicit uh, government debt. Um, I understand that this is difficult to swallow, swallow in the first instance to accept this as implicit government debt, and you ask the question, is this really wealth? And my answer would be yes and no. It depends on what you want to say and demonstrate with this. Uh, and our uh, traditional definition of wealth, something is included which this kind of uh, entitlements on pensions does not include. You cannot inherit this, you cannot sell this on the market. So there's a strong difference between an asset like house or shares or whatever. However, there is a clear influence on your saving decision if you have a fully el elaborated social security system. In countries with no so social security system, 
uh, take China for example, people have to save for themselves. They have very high saving rates in China because they cannot trust that when they are e elderly that the government will give them uh, uh, sufficient accommodation. Uh, so there are aspects of that. And if you, and this would be my, count, my counter question, Peter, if you accept that what we call explicit government debt is private wealth. I was not sure whether you did this. If you accept that, then you must also accept, I think, that what we call implicit government debt is a form of private wealth because between them, <laughs> there's no much a difference. Um, yeah. And, and my formula, Z equals um, T plus L plus uh, D only works if you uh, uh, if you understand that what we call implicit public debt is no. wealth. No, if you just aggregate it, have both sides, just uh, it is for the, the, for, the, for, the, for the people, it is wealth. But the you people see. think it's not, so we are, we are the, the academics, we the are people. not the people. So that's our job is to, and, and they, the, the normal people also don't see this, this all this, this, this uh, present value of, of the, of the pensions they, that they, uh, of course they do. Otherwise, they would save much more. I mean, uh, if you take uh, a, a public official who has a pension, he does, uh, and, and you take a, a self-employed person with the same so-called income, uh, the uh, public, the employed person can save much less than the other person, and therefore there is a strong substitution effect between implicit wealth and, uh, and uh, explicit wealth. And therefore, they have to be uh, put together. OK, and only very, very quick to mark uh, towards Eckert, and then I would allow uh, questions and, and comments from the audience and invite you. Um, I had a long time to struggle with this concept of the natural interest rate in Wixell. And then I came back to Keynes general theory to read what he said about the natural rate. And you mentioned in your remark that um, Summers in his recent paper with Rachel from the beginning of the year changed in his title from natural rate to, um, to neutral rate. And he does not discuss this, it's just there and there's no clear idea why this concept is there. That confused me. And then I thought because, I mean, Summers is a smart guy, that the reason could be that there's not much a difference between big cells, neutral, natural rate, I'm sorry, and Keynes, uh, neutral rate. Because they both, if you look at the definition, and it is there in, in Leonard theory, theory, it's a hypothetical rate of interest that brings about equilibrium in the goods market with full employment. I mean, Keynes has a completely different idea of what um, equilates equilibrates uh, saving in investment, it's via the level of, in, of income, this is clear, but in the end the concept is not that different. One, one short remark, I think Keynes says it's not a good idea to, to talk about this neutral rate or natural rate, he says the best thing is to talk about the optimal rate. I think that's, much, that's what he says in the general theory. Yeah, and probably he meant... And the optimal rate is the rate of growth, the gold growth. Okay, we have some minutes left, and um, you can, Eckhart. Uh, may I also respond to... Uh, Actually, it's I, I not in the scheme. I don't want to take too much time from the audience, but, but I, I think I, well, I, I would like to, to, to make a few comments. So, first of all, I mean, to my knowledge, Keynes is, is, is arguing, well, there are many natural rates depending sure. on the level of income, and yeah. the adjustment towards full employment is not via any rate of interest, be it a natural or a neutral or what, whatever rate. And if and the rate of interest which established at full employment through other mechanisms, yet some other other places, calls a neutral rate, but in, in a completely different context. So you should not you should not uh, 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 equate that with a, with an equilibrium real rate. So that's that. I think these are a different concept, and we should keep things apart and not not merge them where they where they where they do not fit with each other. Uh, maybe two comments on, 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 on your uh, response to, uh, towards my, my critique. Um, steady state analysis, fine, but I mean, you have to explain where, how do we get to the steady state? I mean, if you use steady state as an organizing principle, that's fine with me, but you have, would have to explain how to get there. 
and the adjustment mechanism to, are not clear. Right. I would say still. I mean, even if you if you argue that you exclude the uh, Vixel effect or the price Vixel effect, so reverse capital deepening as as, as it was brought in the Cambridge controversy, you would still have to explain why the choice of technique is is a systematic uh, function of, of your yeah, view. That's what you can do. And, and uh, okay. Uh, I just say there is the critique uh, of the switching of uh, of switching of um, okay maybe maybe uh, leave it I leave it there and uh, have time for you. One short remark to the models. The question is, with all due respect to the models, are they really able to depict the reality in which we live? Does the model have a payoscelosis? I don't know. Does the model have housing as as a, as, as a part of, of what people consume, which is not part of the production process, and is a model able to depict the world where you have household saving, which is not the same thing as corporate saving. Of course you can say the Modigliani, Miller world, everything, but in reality it's two different things. And so the question, I, I have full respect for the model, but is this a model with which you can depict what's it going does. on? It does, I tell you, it does. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Okay, now we have some minutes uh, for questions from the audience. I have Tom Pelly here in the front, and then this gentleman next, and Jan Priebe. Okay, Tom, uh, there are mics, I think. Um, where are the mics? Because otherwise people on the internet won't hear you. Can we just share one of these? OK, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Uh, one of my all-time favorite quotes is from Robert Solow. Uh, it's a quote that he's talking about discussing rational expectations with uh, Bob Lucas and, uh, and Sargent. And he says, goes on like this, he says, if I meet a man in the street who says that he's Napoleon, and he tells me, that he wants to discuss tactics at the Battle of Austerlitz. The last thing I want to do is to agree to discuss tactics at the Battle of Austerlitz with this man because I begin to credit him that he is Napoleon. And this seems to me to go to the core of what's being discussed today. I, at least in the last 10 minutes, you've been discussing tactics at the Battle of Austerlitz. Because what we have heard is that we have global stagnation that is basically a demographic theory of excess saving. Our current condition today is because of demography, uh, growing extended life expectancies, which is causing households to save more, and that's the problem. There's therefore a shortage of assets, and governments has to step in and provide the assets for those, uh, for those households. I think that's what I've understood. Now, it seems to me that the problem, that's not the problem. There is a, a problem of shortage of demand, but it's a problem of demand shortage that's coming from things like income distribution. So, so that, 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 that is the question. That is the Napoleon question. Is it dem demography that's driving our stagnation, or is it something else like income distribution that's driving our stagnation? And I, I, the, the, my second point that then follows on from that, what's interesting is that both points of view, as Eckhart has pointed out, then lead to say, well, let's have government intervention, debt financed. On one side to provide assets for the households and we're going to spend the, their savings, that's what uh, uh, the book is about, and others saying that we're filling the demand gap caused by income distribution. I would like to put on the table, uh, what happens if we do that? And I, I'm an income distribution person, coming so that we've got some fundamental problems. And I think, all, in my view, all the evidence supports that, by the way. In the USA, we've got the same demographics, but we've actually got a shortage of household. Wealth concentration is getting worse and worse. Those who should supposedly be doing the saving Tom, are not doing it. To be short. Yeah. What happens then if we do go this route of government debt does it solve the problem if we leave unaddressed the problem of income distribution? Or does something else go wrong in the future because we haven't addressed the underlying problem? And I think that's something that, as post-Keynesians, we should be thinking about and have not thought about enough. We've just simply said that government debt will solve the problem. Okay. Thank Could you. Could you pass the mic, please, to this gentleman? Thank you. 
Um, Robert Skidelsky. I mean, one of the one of the things that I'm convinced by this discussion is that everyone should do much more history of economic thought, because. Um, by the way, I started arguing this with uh, von Weizsäcker um, in Cologne, um, and uh, this is, ago. in a way, a continuation of the argument. But now, I mean, a lot of these models in in monetary theory um, and uh, involving the rate of interest come out of Vixel, and Vixel sort of leads in two directions. Um, on the one hand, he leads um, to to an Austrian. Um, kind of analysis, and on the other hand, he, he can also, um, um, you can see in that the, the, the problem that leads to Keynesian analysis. And of course, there's a brilliant, a brilliant attempt to reconcile these two things in, in the last comment. But I mean, Vixel starts by saying, okay, I mean, he distinguishes between the voluntary savings of households and credit creation by the Bank of England, about, by, the, by, the, by the banking system. System. He then gets to two rates of interest. There is an equilibrium rate and a, late, and a rate market rate that leads to business fluctuations. In the long run, there's going to be an, the equilibrium rate restores itself. Keynes just does away with all that. He says it's all just it, it, the ideas are unclear. What, it, what is the real distinction between the two rates? And he, he says quite simply that in fact the rate of interest is not what equilibrates saving and investment, that investment is uh, generated independently of the voluntary savings of the public, and that what does equilibrate them are, are changes in income and output. And so he, the rate of interest has no function in Keynes, really, um, uh, and uh, except as, 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 uh, as, 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 as determined by um, liquidity preference. So I think if one, um, if one sort of understands how um, these two strands have developed out of the Vixel connection, um, then I think um, you know, we, can get, we can get a bit clearer about what the issues are today. I personally think um, um, the, um, I would make the, the comment on, on, on the, the book that's been presented, the same sort of comment that um, a student at Cambridge made um, when uh, Hayek uh, presented his famous book, uh, Prices and Production. And, and the student said to him, um, Professor Hayek, do I gather from what you say that if everyone, if, that if I refrained from buying a, 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 um, some goods today, um, unemployment would come down? And, and I think that, that's really it. In other words, if I save more, will there be less unemployment? And I think that's simply just looking at it the wrong way around. If you invest more, there'll be less unemployment. Saving and investment are not connected in the way that um, uh, neoclassical theory assumes it to be. And the rate of interest is not the equilibrating, uh, equilibrating um, mechanism. Okay. Thank you. So, that's a criticism we, we take the third uh, rather than a question. Jan. If you can be short, Jan, promise, Sorry, not a no, new Cobra comment. Um, my, my key question is, where are asset prices in your model? I see uh, the valuation of a value of net wealth in constant prices, if I got you right. Or as relative prices, consumption per unit of uh, uh, net value, net private value. But uh, a main thing that we have under discussion in the huge financialization debates is asset price inflation and revaluation of uh, financial assets and of real value, of, of real assets, uh, like land or, or houses. Uh, wh where is that in your debate? Maybe it is hidden in the book, but you didn't mention, but I think it is simply evaporated. And uh, that is an enormous uh, deficit, if it were so. Uh, the last point, which is not so clear to me, uh, it struck me a little bit when Peter said, um, uh, savings, plural, makes no sense. Well, uh, but saving singular makes sense. So if you then add periods, 
um, investment is added on the right hand side if you look at s equals i so on the right hand side you add it and get the capital stock or some kind so you must have something on the left hand side so you run into a balance sheet approach and you would probably agree that that makes sense so savings uh, um, uh, emulates in the end in, in a balance sheet approach and my my question uh, to the authors is uh, what you really argue uh, in the sense of the uh, saving glut, savings glut theory that it is not only a flow imbalance in a closed economy that will in the end of the period expose there will cannot be an imbalance if you leave out the other countries outside OECD and, and China or are you talking about the stocks I think you were talking about the stocks Right, but you are not unclear about flows and stocks, and the current account issue is a is a flow problem, not a stock problem, right? So, um, I could say more, but I, I am not allowed. Okay, closing remarks uh, because we have already uh, gone beyond five o'clock, and people are happy to get a cup of coffee, and I also invite the critiques to okay. Okay. say what I think. Uh, yes, I think. Yes, could, could, I think we could continue with this debate uh, till midnight. Uh, I don't think that anybody else, that, that many people in the room would stay and, and attend and people outside the room would maybe also switch off the computer. Uh, so I think we have, and I, I've, I've tried to summarize that at the end of, of my comment, we have quite different theories about what drives the um, demand for net financial wealth, what drives the supply of uh, financial liabilities. I mean, we won't find a compromise about that here. But I still would like to bring the message home that all of us are applying strict stock flow uh, accounting principles, and that's something which is very often forgotten, in particular in the economic policy arena. That's very often forgotten also by uh, our neoclassical uh, colleagues, at least some of them, if I follow the more policy-oriented debate. Uh, and irrespective of what uh, uh, now creates uh, the increase in the average propensity to save or the desire for holding net financial wealth, be it distribution, be it demographics, uh, irrespective of what drives the lack of supply of financial liabilities or the uh, stagnation of investment, be it uh, an exhaustion of, of, of technical possibilities, be it a lack of aggregate demand, be it uh, financial factors, we come to the same conclusion. And I think this is something which, which we should not forget and which we should, I think, bring home as a message from this, or bring out as a message from this, 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 this panel. Yeah, I can be relatively short. I want to reiterate, in my view, what we need is explicit debt and not implicit debt. So if we want to stimulate the economy, we say we have stagnation problems and so on, what we need is explicit debt. And so I really do not understand the whole focus on all this implicit debt on the pay as you go system of the book. So in fact, there are also no real limits. So the debt break has no, is no limit for implicit debt. And so I must say, I don't understand this focus. And I would say, let's go ahead with uh, Ex with explicit debt, of course, there's a problem with this. With maybe could also do something about, about wages, but explicit debt is what matters, and we don't need it because of saving due to demographics, but simply because of saving due to high profits. I, I want to um, agree with you that income distribution is, is, of course, a very important issue. Probably we don't agree on what follows from this, but I do uh, admit that in this book there is very little about in income distribution. And this must then follow an, on a other book. <laughs> But before we start writing another book, either on our own or jointly, uh, we have first to bring the message uh, under the people. 
And uh, so we hope that this session acted as a stimulus and you are interested in not only buying but also reading the book or you might wait until next year when the English edition will be published. So with these words, I think I have to close this interesting session. Hope you enjoyed it and wish you a nice coffee break and see you later in the auditorium. Bye-bye.